I gave her a home. I gave her my heart, and my loyalty as we married. I accepted her crazy parents interfering with our lives. So when I gave her my soul, she was chasing belly tingles with someone else. Not just a somebody, no, no no. It was a trusted family friend. They must think, I'm a simp. They never expected me, to be laser focus driven, by the need for revenge. Before we start, be sure to boil six eggs and sneak them with you to the like button's housewarming. Once there, plant these randomly in the like button's basket of fresh eggs. <laughs> Warning, the following story will be upsetting to cheaters. So, here I am, a 27-year-old guy telling his twisted experience with my cheating wife. Let's introduce the star of the show, my wife, Kelly, who's one year my junior. She recently cheated on me with a friend of mine, also a 27-year-old. We'll call him Jay, for story's sake. Our story begins when I was 22. I attended a friend's wedding and happened to be seated next to Kelly. We were both close to the couple, she was tight with the bride, and I was chummy with the groom. Little did we know. Our friends had hatched a plan to play matchmakers, seating us together at the wedding. When I first laid eyes on Kelly, I was utterly gobsmacked by her beauty. As we began to chat, it became apparent that we had a lot of things in common. Our conversation flowed easily, and we clicked instantly. We chatted away, enjoyed the wedding meal, and even swayed to the music on the dance floor. It was a night full of dancing, drinking, and, you guessed it, a little smooching right there in the middle of the dance floor. Our friends, the newlyweds, were ecstatic to see their matchmaking plan unfolding. They playfully asked us about our status, but we just shrugged it off and continued with our night. When we parted ways, we didn't exchange numbers. However, a week later, I received a text from Kelly asking me out, our bride friend had shared my number. Without hesitation, I agreed, and thus, our relationship blossomed. Fast forward a couple of years, and our relationship was thriving, aside from the occasional tiffs that any couple experiences. Nothing really serious ever emerged, so eventually, I popped the question. Less than a year later, we were hitched. We enjoyed a little more than a year of wedded bliss before my world came crashing down around me. Just before our first anniversary, I noticed a shift in Kelly's behavior. She became more protective of her phone, her girls' nights seemed to multiply like rabbits, and our sexy time life dwindled to virtually, non-existent. I brought up these concerns multiple times, only to be dismissed and accused of letting my insecurities get to me. Kelly appeared unaffected by my feelings and concerns, so in response, I grew colder. The tender goodbye kiss as I left for work vanished, and our conversations dwindled to only the necessary ones. Then came the night it got to me and I decided to see for myself. While Kelly slept, I scoured her phone and laptop, rummaging through her texts, emails, and messenger apps, only to find nothing suspicious. However, having read countless stories on here, I knew I had one more place to check, her car. I sneaked inside her car and to my surprise, I found a second phone. I knew in that instant what was going on. Yet, I wanted to gather all the evidence for when I confront her. I didn't want her to brush it off saying it had only happened once or any nonsense like that. I sifted through the phone, finding only one suspicious number. I read every message, connected the phone to my computer, and printed out every conversation and photo. That night, I found myself researching divorce lawyers. In my home office, I spent hours reading lawyer profiles until I found one I liked. I sent him an email, but since it was a Saturday, I didn't expect a response. My curiosity peaked, I wanted to know who the guy was. So, I picked up my phone, dialed the number I had found, and intended to pretend I was Spectrum. But as I dialed, Jay's contact popped up. I felt my world crash. I blew up, yelling and cursing in my office. My wife opened the door to check on me. The moment I saw her, I angrily yelled for her to get out. I had never raised my voice or cursed at her before. That day, I stayed holed up in my office, silently fuming and glaring at the wall. In need of a drink, I called up a friend from the wedding and asked if he would join me. He agreed, probably because he could hear something was wrong in my voice. Without any explanation, I grabbed all the printouts and headed to the bar. I got there first and ordered four shots of Jack and a beer. When my friend, let's call him Tony, arrived, he found me downing my last shot. When he asked what was going on, I blurted out, Kelly's cheating. He was the one who had introduced me to Jay, and all he could say was, 
I'm sorry, over and over again. Although Jay and I were never close, we were friendly whenever we ran into each other at social events. I made Tony promise not to tell anyone about this. I hadn't even spoken to Kelly or a lawyer yet. If his wife asked about me, he was to say I was having problems at work. He agreed. We drank and talked for most of the night. At around 3 a.m., I called an Uber and went home. When I got home, I saw Kelly sleeping on the couch. Without saying a word, I went up to our bedroom and fell asleep. When I woke up, she was lying next to me. Not wanting to confront her yet, I got dressed and left the house. I headed to my office and buried myself in work all day. When I got back home around 10 p.m., my wife was there to greet me. She had made me dinner and asked if I wanted her to heat it up. I simply said no and went to bed. She followed me, asking what had been bothering me. I told her to leave me alone and that I wanted to sleep. She wouldn't let me sleep and kept asking and trying to get my attention. Eventually, I lost my temper and yelled at her to stop and let me sleep. The next morning, I received an email from the lawyer asking to meet later in the day. I confirmed the meeting and got ready to leave. When I walked down, I saw Kelly had made breakfast and wanted to talk. I made a small plate and sat down. She began by saying that I'd been acting differently and going on about how I'd changed. She wanted to know why. I told her work had been stressful and assured her it would be over soon. After finishing my meal, I told her I had to leave for work. I was counting down the minutes until I could meet the lawyer. The meeting with the lawyer went well. I handed over all the evidence I had gathered. The lawyer told me. Well, I'm sorry for all that's going on, but I'm happy you gathered all this information. You see, we live in an at-fault state, so your wife has no claim on most of your money. I was taken aback. I hadn't even thought about that. I just wanted to get a divorce as soon as possible. I asked the lawyer to make copies of the evidence and he agreed. When I got home, I was ready to confront Kelly, but she wasn't there. I called her once, twice, but there was no answer. So, I texted her, I don't care if you're with Jay right now. Get home, we need to talk. Sure enough, she called back in less than a minute, asking what I was talking about. All I told her was to get home now. She showed up 15 minutes later. Interesting, I said, 15 minutes is just about how long it takes to drive from here to Jay's. What a coincidence. She stared at me, looking confused, I gave her a minute to assemble her thoughts but she was clearly too busy practicing her goldfish impression to reply. Lost for words? I asked. She tried to deny everything and starts gaslighting me. As she started to insult me personally, I slammed my fist on the table to put an end to it. Check out this mountain I've built up, I said, pulling out my stack of evidence. I showed her each printout, one at a time. She told me to stop and began to cry. She even tried to apologize and said she loved me. Funny, I said, you were so adamant on degrading and insulting me one minute ago. Where's that fiery spirit now? She tried to hug me, blubbering about how sorry she was. I held up my hand, signaling her to keep her distance. She kept pushing herself towards me, insisting she could make it right and she would do anything for me, asking to go to the bedroom. You suggest we take this to the bedroom? I'm never gonna touch you again. Also, do you know who else has these documents? My lawyer. I'm divorcing you. Now grab a bag, pack up your things, get the frick out of my house. That was three days ago, and since then, there's been radio silence from her. I apologize for the length of this story. I'm curious, for those who've been in my shoes, what should I brace myself for next? Thanks for being here with me. Bravo! You've tackled that situation like a true champ. Now let's go over the post-game plan. First and foremost, it's time to go on a financial spring cleaning spree. Take her off all your accounts, insurance, credit cards, the works. Change every single one of your passwords. Next, book yourself an STD test. It's never a fun afternoon, but hey, better safe than unknowingly harboring a rogue parasite. And please, for the love of all that's holy, don't act out in anger. As much as you might want to give her or Jay a piece of your mind or fist, don't. Follow your lawyer's advice religiously. Ask him if you can change the locks on the house. She's effectively abandoned ship, so it's only right you secure the fort. Steer clear of booze. It might seem like an easy escape, but trust me, they're about as helpful as a chocolate teapot. Brace yourself for the storm that's coming. It'll be a whirlwind of begging, gaslighting, and blame shifting. She might even try to play the victim card and paint you as the villain in her twisted narrative. Don't let her. Broadcast your side of the story. Share it with your parents, friends, 
and especially if Jay has a girlfriend or wife, share it with her. Channel all that pent-up anger and rage into exercise. It's a great way to blow off some steam, keep you grounded, and tire you out for a good night's sleep, which might seem like a distant memory as the reality of the situation sinks in. Good luck, soldier, and keep us in the loop. We're rooting for you. Much appreciated for the advice, I'll stick to that. Lawyer told me all communication between her and I should go through him, so hopefully I won't be talking to her at all. Jay does have a fiancé and I'm planning on telling her. How do you plan on contacting Jay's fiancé? I'm sure he knows that you know, and will likely be on the lookout for anything in the mail or you showing up at the house, etc. Hopefully he doesn't have access to monitor her email or socials? I've met her a few times and I have her personal number. I will try to contact her until she answers and if she doesn't, I'll go to their house when he's at work. I'll put a note in her car to contact me, I won't let that jerk get away scot-free. You my friend, are a savage and I love it. It's bad enough for someone to cheat, but it's so much worse when they cheat with someone you actually know. I think trying to talk to the fiancé is a great idea. Nobody deserves to be treated like this, and I hope you can heal and find someone who is truly right for you. Sending hugs your way. Thank you, I know it'll suck for a while but I'll work through it. Good on you man, swift and decisive action. So sorry that you got caught up with another fake friend out here, but you will come out on top in the end. They always can explain, expect the begging and crying to continue when she gets the divorce papers, it didn't mean anything, I don't love him and other bullcrap. Expose her to all near and far after. The thing is, if she was blowing up my phone I could ignore it, but the silence is making me uneasy, like what scheme is this woman up to? She ain't scheming, she's afraid of what is to come. Smoke them out to everyone and get her served. Let the fiancé of the other lowlife know too. Her actions before all of this, just showed that she never really gave a crap about you, especially with the dead bedroom, but I guess we know why now. Can't trust no one these days bro. So. My lawyer advised against publicly shaming her or him as it could hurt my case, but I will have her served at work as I have no idea where she is staying now. I will tell his fiancé everything and give copies of all the evidence. Hello everyone. First off, a big thank you to all of you who took the time to comment or send me messages. Your advice and praise mean a lot to me. My apologies if I haven't managed to answer all your comments, I've been trying to keep up. After the initial post, I found myself flooded with tons of advice. Being the sensible man I try to be, I decided to follow most of it. This morning was all about damage control. First on the list, booking an appointment with the doctor for an STD check. That's now lined up for two days from now. Next, I reached out to my support network, my father and a few close friends. They've all been very supportive offering their own advice and even help. But, as I've got this disaster on a fairly tight leash, I politely declined their help. Then came the time to face her family. I sent a text to her mom and dad expressing my gratitude for welcoming me into their family and for all they had done for me. But, with a heavy heart, not really, they were kind of suffocating, and although they're nice people, I'm relieved I no longer have to deal with them, I informed them that Kelly and I were getting divorced. I told them they could ask me any questions if they wanted to. Next. I had to break the news to Kelly's sister. We had been good friends, and I knew this news would destroy that friendship. I texted her, hey, I'm sorry to have to text you this, but Kelly and I are getting divorced. I wanted you to know. From day one, you accepted me as a brother and I'll still be here if you ever need anything from me. Shortly after, her parents got back to me. Here's how that conversation went. We're so sorry to hear this. What happened? Why hasn't Kelly said anything to us? Kelly's been in an affair for at least a year. I thought she might have reached out to you. We haven't heard from her, we'll call her, are you sure about the affair? I'm positive. I found their texts. We're so sorry. We'll try to get in touch with her. After dealing with her family, it was time to take on the big task of facing Jay's fiancé. I had a sinking feeling that Kelly and Jay might have created some ingenious plan to keep hiding their secret. Either Kelly hadn't spilled the beans about me knowing, or they're just idiots. I texted her around 2 p.m., asking if we could meet for a coffee. We met at some trendy coffee shop. As I sipped on my awful coffee, I said to her, 
there's no easy way to say this, so I'll just say it. Jay has been cheating on you with my wife for over a year. She was obviously taken aback, so I added, I only found out a few days ago. I should have told you then, but I had a divorce to kickstart and my own pity party to attend. She asked how I found out, so I told her everything that's in the first post. I asked if she wanted to see the evidence I'd gathered and pulled out a binder. She grabbed the binder and skimmed through the messages and pictures and just started to silently cry. I told her she was more than welcome to take the binder. I even had extra copies, just in case she wanted to confront Jay or test his lying skills. She thanked me, stood up, took the binder and left. As she walked away, she looked utterly defeated. Before she left, I made sure to let her know that if she needed anything from me, all she had to do was ask. Now, I know many of you advised me to stay sober and keep a clear head. But honestly, my world has just crashed down on top of me. So I've decided to take this week to marinate in self-pity on my back porch, grab some drinks, cigars, and some loud music. But don't worry, this pity party will stop once the week is over, I plan to stop feeling sorry for myself and get back to my usual schedule. On a lighter note, I've already packed up most of her things, clothes, jewelry, etc. I also did her a favor and included our wedding book and every photo with her in it, in the boxes. I've been told I'm a generous guy. If and when she decides to come back, for her stuff, I don't plan on playing the gracious host for longer than necessary. And before your imagination runs wild, let me assure you that I didn't ruin her clothes or anything. Okay, I may have broken a few picture frames, but I mean, who's counting? As of right now, everything's rather quiet. I've done my duty, spreading the grim news of the cheating to everyone who needed to know. My doctor's appointment is booked, my lawyer's working to get me out of this mess, and 90% of her things are neatly packed in boxes. If she continues to keep her distance, this might turn out to be the smoothest divorce in history. Thanks for sticking with me through all of this. Your advice and support are always appreciated. Good work bro. I was able to read your story before it got removed. You are on the right path, keep it going. Everything is going like clockwork, and you're handling it like a boss. She must be still in total shock, wondering how the hell you found her burner phone and exposed their nasty booties. What a vile person she is, for exposing your health like that to their filth and coming to kiss you afterwards. Keep spraying that disinfectant until all the roaches are gone. What is sad here, is that his fiancée is also an innocent victim, was their affair worth so many people's happiness? That's why I offered my sympathy, and I was serious if she needs anything from me, I'd be more than happy to help. Hello everyone. I apologize for my recent disappearance and the radio silence on comments and messages. I believe I've now caught up, so here's what's new. Since the last update, I've been indulging in my personal pity party. Drinking, drinking, and more drinking. I'd say this is my first semi-sober moment since the revelation hit me. The whole train of emotions has been hard to articulate but numb is probably the best descriptor. So I mentioned that I had notified everyone about the situation. The only one who didn't respond was Kelly's sister, Wendy, whom I've always been very close to. That very night, after a few more drinks, I passed out on my back patio, a motley collection of bottles and beer cans keeping me company. I woke up to the smell of breakfast being cooked. My first thought was, oh Christ, Kelly is back and thinks a breakfast bribe is her ticket to redemption. Bracing myself for a screaming match, I was shocked to see it was Wendy. Wendy saw I was awake, sprinted to me and wrapped her arms around me. She then led me to the table and served up a plate. As I ate, she shared her side of the story. Apparently, Kelly had shown up at her house, downplaying our problems as a temporary bump. When I texted Wendy about the divorce, she confronted Kelly, who broke down and confessed everything. I corrected her, there's no way she told you everything. I then recounted the sordid details. Wendy revealed that Kelly had tried to play it off as a one-time mistake. I made it clear to Wendy that reconciliation with Kelly wasn't an option and that Kelly should find herself a lawyer. To my surprise, Wendy was there for me. She confirmed that while she cared for her sister, she was my friend too and wouldn't abandon me. This warmed my heart. Wendy stayed with me for two days, in the guest bedroom, you heathens, and left this morning. As she was leaving, I was packing for a trip to my cabin, which I owned before the marriage, so it's off limits too, Kelly. I was gathering my hunting and fishing gear when Wendy asked to join. As much as I appreciated the company, I suggested she should probably check on her sister. 
She agreed, gave me a hug and left. To any of you conjuring up a love story between Wendy and me, hold your horses. She's only 20, far too young for me. We share a great friendship, nothing more. In other news, I did get tested at the doctors. The results should be in by Monday. I've also been checking in on Jay's fiance, offering to lend an ear if she needs to vent. I'll be online for a while, so feel free to drop any questions or advice in the comments or messages. However, I'm heading to the cabin for the weekend, where the internet is non-existent, so I'll be off-grid. I want to thank each one of you for reading, reaching out, and showering me with support. You all have been the light at the end of a very dark tunnel. To those of you going through similar predicaments, my advice is to stay focused. Set one goal at a time, in my case, it was lawyer, doctor, then notifying everyone. And remember, keep your personal affairs off the internet. Thank you again for your patience and support. This is good news OP. I'm glad that you have a support network. I just wish it wasn't for this reason. You'll be better off with her out of your life. You don't realize who will support you or what type of support you'll get until something goes wrong in your life. I'm happy with who I've got. Here I am again, I told you all about Wendy coming to my house and staying for a few days. She left when I was heading to my cabin for some hunting. Good news! I bagged a nice fat 8-pointer buck on my first day out there. This was a great stroke of luck, as it left the rest of my time for fishing. I caught two decent-sized ones, which turned into a meal and the next one to be butchered. I spent the rest of my stay at the cabin processing my deer and enjoying the natural views. Apart from a drink or two a day, I spent my trip sober, as promised. My drinking spree was confined to the previous week. Now on to the events of the past few days. I got a call from my doctor and thankfully, all is clear. Not too surprising given the lack of passionate nights with Kelly in the past few months, but you can never be too sure. I reached out to Jay's fiancé, but didn't hear back for some time. She eventually responded, saying she was staying with her family. Reading between the lines, it seems it's not going too well for her either. I told her if there's anything I could do, she just had to reach out. She asked to meet for coffee, which I readily agreed to. We met at the same quirky hipster coffee shop the next day and talked for about two hours. We discussed everything about Kelly and me. She was curious about the steps I was taking and whether there was any chance of reconciliation. I made it clear that cheating was a deal breaker for me. Given the selfishness and disrespect it takes to cheat, let alone for a year, it was evident Kelly didn't really care for me. When asked about her plan, she said she was confused as everything she thought was true turned out to be lies. She wasn't sure about her next step, whether to move on or forgive him. I candidly told her, if you can forgive someone for cheating on you for that long, you're a better person than me. She shared that her family was suggesting that she forgive Jay and proceed with their marriage. I told her, just because it's what your family wants doesn't mean you need to follow along. Jay obviously doesn't respect marriage, he cheated on you, his fiancé, with my wife. That's a clear sign he's not marriage material, I urged her to do what she thought was right and to make her own decisions. I recounted, when I found out, I tried to find a way my heart could trick my brain into thinking I could accept it and forgive her, but I just couldn't do it. I encouraged her to follow her gut feeling. As per my experience, the brain and heart can sometimes lead you astray, but gut instincts are usually on the mark. She thanked me and we parted ways. The following day, my lawyer informed me that Kelly had been served at her workplace. Wendy called me soon after, saying Kelly hadn't left her room all day and was sobbing in bed. I explained she'd been served and was probably grappling with the consequences of her actions. Wendy asked about my cabin trip and I filled her in. After a brief chat, we hung up, and I began preparing myself for the possible storm that Kelly might unleash now that she's been served. So, here I am, waiting patiently and on standby with Advil for the potential headache. I've informed my friend and he's agreed to come over and be a witness, just in case things get out of hand. I'm currently writing this, awaiting Hurricane Kelly to potentially tear through my house. If or when she does, I'll send out another update. Thank you all for reading. Get some security cameras, freeze your credit, update your lawyer on the changes, move half the money where she can't access it, secure your documents, take photos of everything if you suspect she will damage your property. Cameras have been up inside and outside the house since we moved in. Lawyer said there's nothing he or I can do, as it's also her house. I also can't pull any money out of our shared account until the divorce is finalized, but I don't have to add any anymore.
Hello again, everyone. I know I only posted two days ago, but I have some news to share. Things have been a bit wild since my last post, and I haven't had the chance to get to the comments yet, so I apologize for not having responded or read through them. For those who are seeing my post for the first time, here's a quick rundown of everything that's happened so far. My wife exhibited the typical signs of infidelity, so I snooped and found a second phone in her car. This led me to immediately seek out a lawyer, start the legal process, and confront my wife. After a verbal spat, she packed a bag and left. I then informed our close friends, my father, and her family about the situation. Additionally, I contacted her affair partner's fiancé and revealed everything I knew and could prove. Two days ago, she was served at her job. Now, you're up to date. About an hour or so after my last post, I was waiting for Kelly to show up at the house. Given everything that's happened, I wasn't sure what to expect from her. I checked all the security cameras around the house to ensure they were working properly, both inside and outside. I also called my friend, alerting him that Kelly was served today and if she shows up, he needs to come over as soon as possible. I was not going to jail because of this woman. As it turns out, my caution was justified. Kelly showed up at the house, banging on the door and screaming to be let in. I immediately called my friend and Wendy to come over. She was cursing and begging me to let her in. All I could do was laugh, wondering why she didn't just use her keys to enter. When my friend arrived, he stayed in his truck and started recording the ongoing drama on his phone. His wife, a friend of Kelly's, got out of the truck and tried to calm Kelly down. Instead, Kelly slapped her and screamed at her to mind her own business. This made my friend call the authorities. When they arrived, Kelly tried to play the victim. She cried and told the officers that I hit her and threw her out of the house. My friend and his wife relayed what they saw when they arrived, but since they didn't see the initial event, they couldn't confirm or deny Kelly's accusations. One of the officers approached my door, and as soon as I opened it, Kelly pointed at me, claiming I hit her and demanded my arrest. I was being put in handcuffs when I insisted that I could prove her lies. The officer allowed me to show him the footage from the outdoor cameras. Upon reviewing the video, the officer apologized for jumping to conclusions and assuming I was at fault. I told him I didn't blame him. Apparently, during Kelly's rant, she screamed out he hit me, leading my neighbors to call the authorities too, causing the officers to form their judgment even before arriving. After dealing with the authorities for about half an hour, Kelly was eventually handcuffed and charged with disturbing the peace, public intoxication, and a DUI. As the police were escorting Kelly to their car, Wendy showed up. She asked me what had happened, so I showed her the video of the whole ordeal on my phone. An officer approached me, handing me the case number and some other paperwork. Wendy started asking questions about the charges, so I just went back inside. Wendy followed me in shortly after and sat down next to me. She explained that she had only left her house for 10 minutes to run to the store. When she returned, Kelly was no longer in the living room. She assumed Kelly had gone to bed after having too much wine. Wendy and I talked for a while. She asked if she could stay the night, and I told her she was welcome anytime. Wendy informed me that Kelly had to spend the night in jail, I'm not sure why, but she could be bailed out in the morning. After I had gone back inside, Wendy called her parents to let them know what was happening and to see if they could bail Kelly out, since Wendy didn't have the necessary funds. We shared a beer and soon, went to bed. When I woke up the next morning, Wendy had already left to meet with her parents. I haven't heard from Kelly, Wendy, or their parents since then, but I can only imagine that it's not a pleasant conversation they're having. I'm so glad you had cameras installed. Cheaters tend to spiral out of control once their lies begin to unravel, scrambling to concoct new lies to cover their tracks. You should relay this false domestic violence accusation to your lawyer as soon as possible for your divorce proceedings. Even if it can't be used directly, I'm sure a judge won't view it kindly. Your soon-to-be ex may be inclined to expedite matters if you agree to leave this incident out of the proceedings. Who knows? Regardless, she's really dug herself into a hole here. You're extremely fortunate to have those cameras. I suggest buying a lottery ticket and planning a nice vacation for yourself. I hope everything goes smoothly for you from here on out, and that you're able to separate from her quickly. Unfortunately, it sounds like she might hit rock bottom first and drag you down with her along the way. I'm sorry for what you're going through. I haven't heard from Kelly since that incident, but her lawyer contacted mine, indicating that he will be representing her. Finally, we can proceed with the legal process. 
Additionally, I reached out to Jay's fiancé to check if there were any updates from her side. We exchanged a few text messages, and she informed me that she had kicked Jay out of her house. Her father and brother packed up all his belongings and took them to his place. She confided that while her father and brother were tempted to confront Jay physically, she requested them not to. She wants to leave this mess behind her and move forward. She appreciated me checking up on her and assured me that her close friends were there to support her. I shared my Reddit page link with her, so that she could see all the support that you all have been giving to me and her. On Friday, as soon as I finished work, I rushed home. My plan was to spend the weekend at my cabin. Upon my arrival, I found Wendy in my driveway. She wanted to collect her sister's belongings and had a list of items that Kelly expected to be returned. Almost all of the items were already packed in a box or stored in my garage, waiting to be picked up. I made it clear to her that I wouldn't be responsible for any accusations of damage to Kelly's belongings. Instead, I offered to pay for a moving company to come, pack, and transport all her things. This was due to the fact that I was heading to my cabin, and didn't have time to deal with Kelly's issues. Wendy agreed and hoped that I would have a good time. She took a box of Kelly's clothes and placed them in her car. Before leaving, she asked if she could join me on my trip to the cabin, to which I happily agreed. The weekend at the cabin went really well. The last time I was there, I realized what a treasure that place was. With its beautiful views and complete seclusion, it offered a tranquil retreat where one could truly relax. On Monday, I called a moving company and by Tuesday, three men with a large truck came and started loading Kelly's belongings. I meticulously recorded and took photos of each item as they were being packed and loaded. I thanked the movers for their patience and tipped each of them an extra $50. I sent all the photos and recordings to my lawyer and continued with my day. The house feels empty but clean without all of Kelly's stuff. My lawyer had advised me not to discard anything that could be considered shared property, so I moved most of the furniture to a storage unit. I have been sleeping in the guest room since she left, and only now have I started buying new furniture. Most of it will likely stay in the garage now that I have the space. Despite everything, I don't plan on keeping the house even if I win it in the divorce, as it holds too many painful memories now. Thank you for reading. I'm glad to see that you have maintained your strength my dude, and are finding new and better ways to retaking your power. Keep that energy going. It will be your guide to getting out of this nightmare. Very admirable of you to checking in on the other betrayed spouse. She appreciates it more than you know. And it's good that you won't be keeping the house, it's nothing but scars. You owe it to yourself to have a clean slate. And I've got to break it to you, Wendy got the hots for you. Keep riding the light brother. Basically, anything I had when I was with her, I'm getting rid of. I don't think she does but either way, I'm not interested in any relationship at all. I have been following your situation on Reddit since the beginning and I must say that you've tackled everything like a champ. And the fact that you have been checking up the cheater's wife too, shows you're a good man with a good heart. Needless to say she traded gold for a turd as her affair partner is someone who himself is a cheater. I wish you all the very best for your healing journey. Thank you for your support throughout all this. It'll be funny when she finally comes to her senses she messed up. Sooner or later, she will realize and will try to crawl back with a sob story. On top of it once the dust settles, she'll be mad that her sister and you're still friends. Hey folks, here's a new update. A few days after the movers transported Kelly's things, my lawyer received some paperwork. Apparently, I had somehow damaged her belongings and she was demanding I pay her $1,500, threatening to take me to court otherwise. My lawyer, undeterred, promptly sent her lawyer all the videos and pictures, asking where these so-called damages were. According to him, this situation just further shows her instability to the judge and, while it may be a headache now, it will serve as excellent evidence in court. It appears her lawyer wasn't quite prepared for the level of meticulousness I possess. I mean, I've photographed and documented everything. When I discovered my wife's affair, for some reason, I found myself drawn to this page. I read the horror stories about what some people's former spouses did to them and I adamantly refuse to let myself be another statistic. I've braced myself for just about every accusation she could throw at me. At this point, there's little she could do that would surprise me. Kelly has been calling me roughly every other day. but. Like a man avoiding a telemarketer, I never pick up. If she leaves a voicemail, I don't even bother listening to it. 
Instead, I just forward it straight to my lawyer. Every time I send something to my lawyer, he chuckles and tells me. You are a lawyer's dream. You heed every piece of advice, and you've compiled a mountain of evidence all on your own. I have yet to encounter a client who has performed so exceptionally well. It's no exaggeration when I say he repeats this every time, but it always brings a grin to my face. Having that reassurance that I'm doing everything right certainly makes this crazy situation a little more bearable. Roughly two or three weeks ago, my lawyer informed me that we had enough evidence to bury her outside of court. If our attempt fails, at least it would reflect favorably on us for trying. We scheduled a date to meet in a neutral lawyer's office. He advised me not to react to anything Kelly might say, reminding me that everything would be recorded for a judge to read if it goes to court. We arrived early and, to my surprise, she was already there waiting with her lawyer. It was like a scene from a courtroom drama. The lawyers began their polite exchange while Kelly and I sat in silence, the tension palpable. Kelly's lawyer broke the ice, inquiring about our offer. My lawyer, with a scoff that could rival a sitcom character, responded. Given the mountain of evidence detailing Kelly's infidelity and inappropriate behavior, the only offer we'll make is half of the selling price of the house and half of the savings account. That's more than any judge would award you. Essentially, you'll walk away with what you came into the marriage with. Kelly began to cry, asking if there was anything she could do to fix things. I replied, you've been cheating on me since before our wedding. There's nothing you could do to make me forget or forgive what you've done. Sign the papers. It's more than you deserve, and I want to be done with this whole sham you created. She excused herself to the restroom, presumably to compose herself. Upon returning, still teary-eyed, she signed the papers and left soon after. In about a month, everything will be filed, and all I'll need to do is sell the house. I can't express enough gratitude for all of your support and advice. Also, a shout out to viewers on YouTube. I can't predict if anything else will happen, but if it does, I'll keep you updated. However, this is likely my last post. Once again, thank you all. I hope my experience has helped at least one person out there. Mad respect, King. You deserve better than that immoral woman. She will remain miserable for the rest of her life while you would move forward and build a new one. Congratulations on your freedom. I'm so glad that you remain meticulous instead of becoming an emotional wreck. Your example is perfect for what to do to or for a cheating partner. Congratulations. Happy you got closure. This story demonstrates that no contact and diligent documentation work wonders. Mix in some self-respect and firm resolve, and you've got a winning recipe. I sense that you're currently on an adrenaline rush, and there might be a crash when the finality of it all hits home. But remember, you faced that initial shock when you discovered the betrayal. You handled it well then, you'll handle it well now. It's genuinely uplifting to know there are still genuine, strong individuals out there. You're bound to lead a good life. Your consistent, difficult decision-making has paved the way for a swift exit. This is the positive outcome when there's no pick-me dance involved. Please continue to keep us posted. Your soon-to-be ex-wife's ill-conceived attempt at breakfast in bed after exposure perfectly sums up her trajectory. A continued pattern of poor choices will lead her to a future where she's left with nothing. But here's a word of caution. Her sister has been visiting your place quite a lot. Please don't get swayed. Maintain your distance. There's a slight danger of her wanting more than just casual visits, and that could lead to your ex re-entering your life like a bad horror movie sequel that nobody asked for. However, you've shown yourself to be level-headed, and you've probably already thought of this, so disregard my caution if it doesn't apply. We tend to be emotional during high-stress times in our lives. Find peace, heal, and then venture out to the dating world. You have all the makings of a great partner and a fantastic father. Good luck. That wraps it up for this episode. Any advice for OP? Drop it down below. Smack the like button back to the future. As you know, more episodes are coming soon. You know I got you covered. Before I forget, if you have a story you're willing to share, feel free to send it in. You might make it to be covered on this channel, Royal AI. Bye bye, see you in the next one.